Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of God and in the face of this congregation to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is an honorable estate instituted of God himself, signifying unto us the mystical union that is betwixt Christ and his church, which holy estate Christ adorned and beautified with his presence and first miracle that he wrought in Cana of Galilee and is commended in Holy Writ to be honorable among all men. And therefore is not by any to be enterprised nor taken in hand unadvisedly, lightly, or wantonly, but reverently, discreetly, soberly, and in the fear of God, duly considering the causes for which matrimony was ordained. First, it was ordained for the increase of mankind according to the will of God, and that children might be brought up in the fear and nurture of the Lord and to the praise of his holy name. Secondly, it was ordained in order that the natural instincts and affections implanted by God should be hallowed and directed aright, that those who are called of God to this holy estate should continue therein in pureness of living. Thirdly, it was ordained for the mutual society, help and comfort that the one ought to have of the other, both in prosperity and in adversity into which holy estate these two persons present come now to be joined. Therefore, if any man can show any just cause why they may not lawfully be joined together, let him now speak, or else hereafter forever hold his peace. We figured that would be a good point to take a break. When we return, we're going to get into the vows. Here's one note that you might want to uh, listen for when we return. Diana flubbed uh, the prince's name. Uh, he has a couple of middle names, and she transposed them as uh, she was taking the vows. So that's one interesting bit of trivia. And if you joined us late, time and again, we'll re-air uh, the wedding. Time and again with Jane Pauley this evening at 8 and 11 p.m. Eastern right here on MSNBC. When we return, we will return to the wedding of the century. It shall be disclosed that if either of you know any impediment why ye may not be lawfully joined together in matrimony, ye do now confess it. For be ye well assured that so many as are coupled together otherwise than God's word doth allow are not joined together by God, neither is their matrimony lawful. Charles Philip Arthur George, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her, so long as ye both shall live? I will. Diana Francis, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband, to live together according to God's law in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love him, comfort him, honor and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live? I will. Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? <coughs> I, Charles Philip Arthur George. I, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee, Diana Francis. Take thee, Diana Francis. To my wedded wife. To my wedded wife. 
to have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And thereto I give thee my troth. And thereto I give thee my troth. I, Diana Francis. I, Diana Francis. Take thee, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee, Philip Charles Arthur George. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And thereto I give thee my troth. And thereto I give thee my troth. Bless, O Lord, this ring, and grant that he who gives it and she who shall wear it may remain faithful to each other and abide in thy peace and favor and live together in love until their lives end. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. With this ring, with this ring, I thee wed, I thee wed. With my body, with my body, I thee honor, I thee honor. And all my worldly goods with thee I share, with all thy goods with thee I share. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O eternal God, creator and preserver of all mankind, giver of all spiritual grace, the author of everlasting life, send thy blessing upon these thy servants, this man and this woman, whom we bless in thy name that living faithfully together, they may surely perform and keep the vow and covenant betwixt them made, whereof this ring given and received is a token and pledge, and may ever remain in perfect love and peace together, and live according to thy laws, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Those whom God has joined together, let no man put asunder. For as much as Charles Philip Arthur George and Diana Francis have consented together in holy wedlock and have witnessed the same before God and this company, and thereto have given and pledged their troth either to other, and have declared the same by giving and receiving of a ring and by joining of hands. I pronounce that they be man and wife together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, bless, preserve, and keep you. The Lord mercifully, with his favor, look upon you, and so fill you with all spiritual benediction and grace, that ye may so live together in this life, that in the world to come ye may have life everlasting. Amen.
at RAF North Holt in West London. On her last journey home aboard the Royal Scot, a BAE 146 of the Queen's flight, Diana was accompanied by her former husband, the Prince of Wales, and by her two sisters. RAF pallbearers and escorts of the Queen's colour squadron received the coffin, which was wound with the royal standard. One man carried a wreath of lilies. The party was attended on the tarmac by the Prime Minister and the Defence Secretary George Robertson. Buckingham Palace sources say Diana has been accorded the same ceremonial honours as a full member of the royal family, although she ceased to hold that rank after her divorce. The princess's body will be taken to a private mortuary in London. Prince Charles went back aboard the royal aircraft. He's returning to Balmoral to be with his sons. These scenes were none the less extraordinary for being so formal. The day had dawned in equally sombre mood. of remembrance told over London and flags flew at half-mast as the nation awoke to news of Diana's death. Confirmation came as most people had been sleeping, too late for most Sunday papers. In many cases, people who could never have known her grieved as if they'd lost someone close. There was in this remarkable, young, very attractive woman a combination of the ordinary and the extraordinary. The ordinary is the way in which she seemed so like us. And the extraordinary was her ability to touch the lives of so many people, to bring grace into their lives. The Prime Minister, who went to church in his constituency with his family, said the people of Britain felt utterly devastated. They kept faith with Princess Diana. They liked her, they loved her. They regarded her as one of the people. She was the people's princess. And that's how she will stay, how she will remain in our hearts and in our memories. Mr Blair's political opponents agreed to suspend campaigning over devolution in Scotland and Wales because of the princess's death. The work that she did for so many charitable causes did actually reflect a, a genuine human warmth and compassion and interest. Uh, she had a lot of love for people and that came through. This is, although a national tragedy, preeminently a personal one. And our first thoughts must be for her close family, the princes, the Prince of Wales, and uh, those who were related to her. Three families have been bereaved. Mohammed Al Fayed, the owner of Harrods, flew to Paris in the early hours of this morning to recover his son's body. The world has lost a, a princess who is, quite frankly, irreplaceable. And Mr. Al Fayed has lost a, a greatly loved eldest son. The princess's brother spoke to reporters at his home in Cape Town. Can you ring the IFB All those who've come into contact with Diana, particularly over the past 17 years, will share my family's grief. She was unique. She understood the most precious needs of human beings, particularly those that suffered. And her vibrancy and sparkle, combined with a very real sense of duty, are now gone forever. It is heartbreaking to lose such a human being especially when she was only 36. Diana famously did her growing up in public. The abrupt snuffing out of her life is clearly also a public matter. Stephen Smith reporting. The Prince of Wales was woken in the middle of the night to be told that Diana was dead. He in turn then... That is uh, Stephen Smith of uh, ITN. Uh, we're going to go now to uh, our own Charles Sabine, who is... Uh, more than 2,000 pieces of email. We've also watched dozens and dozens of websites cre uh, spring up overnight and today. Right now, I've got on the screen the British monarchy official website, and this is from Buckingham Palace. And what they are doing is suggesting that people can send condolence messages to this website. I should point out that it's very difficult, John, to get onto this website. We've had a very hard time, and we're unable to get past this particular opening What's page. It 
Uh, it says Diana, Princess of Wales, 1 July 1961 to 31 August 1997. And then it's got biography, press releases, uh, an area for condolences, and then the main British monarchy site. This is a site that was put up uh, several months ago. There are also all kinds of homegrown sites put up all over the world, uh, all across the internet. This one says tears flow across nations. Um, this is another one with that very same picture and uh, asking for, uh, here's an article from the Sunday Times. Many of these are asking for email messages of condolences and I just want to quickly go through these to show you that how many there are and uh, how many people are out there emailing about this. Many of them just expressing sympathy and condolences. Uh, he, my condolences to you and your family. The world will mourn in the departure of this wonderful woman. Many people sending out uh, condolences to the family and to the young princes. Uh, also, there is a, a campaign underway, John, on the internet to, uh, ta to boycott, really, the, the tabloid press. And uh, here's one, you can help stop the paparazzi. I've got several to show you here, but also I'm told that within the last hour, there have been another half dozen of these boycott the tabloids. Uh, it's sort of a, a campaign going on all across the world. Asking What's going people, on, MK, I don't want to interrupt you. What about the chat rooms? Well, on the chat rooms, we're getting a little bit more of a, a mixed picture. Uh, some people are saying that it's absurd to blame the paparazzi and that, you know, there, there was somebody driving the car and, uh, and what was anybody holding a gun to their heads to drive so fast. So a little bit more balance. Uh, the email messages have been largely uh, condolence messages. Some have been criticizing the paparazzi and some have been also been talking about the funeral arrangements and really saying that they, they believe that um, Princess Diana should receive a royal funeral. So those are kind of the topics that are being addressed on the Internet. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mary Kathleen Flynn at the Internet desk. Uh, we'll check in with you later. It, it, it appears that uh, the volume on the Internet is going to uh, grow all day, and we'll keep an eye on it. Uh, on the phone with us now... I... And for our love for her children, William and Harry. She was uh, undoubtedly one of the best ambassadors of Great Britain. You could see that she was very much concerned about the poor people and she wanted to definitely something by helping me to help them. She was a wonderful and a warm human being. Though her own life was often sadly touched by tragedy, she touched the lives of so many others in Britain throughout the world with joy and with comfort. For a Florida-based tabloid newspaper, the National Enquirer. Stephen Kaz appeared on several television talk shows this morning. He urged the world press to boycott those pictures. We have refused to buy these pictures. They were offered to us last night. On the world market, they're looking for a million dollars. We have refused to buy them, and we're asking that the rest of the world press join us in shunning these photos. Photographers followed Diana everywhere she went. The North Carolina-based National News Photographers Association today issued a statement expressing its sorrow and noting the, quote, significant differences between traditional photojournalist and the paparazzi who hounded Diana's every move. When news photographers and TV cameras arrived at the Paris hospital where Diana died, hospital patients and staff shouted at them yelling murderers. That outrage was felt by many at the news that Diana and her boyfriend died while apparently fleeing, pursuing photographers. Rob Roth reports. This is what Princess Diana saw almost everywhere she went. The paparazzi dogged her every move, chased her like bounty hunters in London, and in Paris they apparently chased her until she died. At least that's what her brother said today. I always believed the press would kill her in the end. But not even I could imagine that they would take such a direct hand in her death, as seems to be the case. It would appear that every proprietor and editor of every publication that has paid for intrusive and exploitative photographs of her encouraging greedy and ruthless individuals to risk everything in pursuit of Diana's image has blood on his hands today. 
Pictures of Princess Diana sell newspapers in Great Britain. We found these back issues of British tabloids today on the racks of an international newsstand in the Bay Area. There are photos of Diana everywhere. These vacation shots netted the freelance photographer a reported $400,000. Even video of her, blurry and shaky, was still good enough for broadcast on British television recently. Paparazzi have said they will stop at nothing to get the shot. If I wanted the photo bad enough, there probably wouldn't be anything I wouldn't do. Every time you go out, you know that you could get something sensational. Actor Tom Cruise says he knows what it's like to be pursued by paparazzi. I've actually been in that same tunnel being chased by paparazzi, and they run lights, and they chase you and harass you the whole time. It happens. Um, all over the world, and it, it has certainly gotten worse. I would take a step ladder, and I would be able to stand above the crowd. San Francisco documentary photographer Scott Stewart lived in London for 25 years and photographed the royal family, not for the tabloids, but for the more genteel royal magazines. And he says he only took pictures at public events. For the British paparazzi, he says the stakes are high. They're under an awful lot of pressure to, um, to make a living. They've got to they're hanging around outside of restaurants, nightclubs, um, houses, residences, up to all hours of the night trying to get some little bit of news or scandal. Many say the paparazzi wouldn't exist if the public didn't devour these publications and demand more. But this ethics professor at the University of Santa Clara says there is no law that says photographers have to work for tabloids. If people work for them, they know they've got to come up with sensational stories and photographs. Uh, editors or photographers or journalists. So uh, the people who work in that profession have, have bought on to a different level of, of journalist ethics. There is some talk today in London and Paris about passing some legislation that would somehow, some way, clamp down on the paparazzi. But many scholars we spoke with say that's unlikely to happen in this country and that the unbridled pursuit of celebrities will continue. Rob Roth for the 5 o'clock news. And we will have more on the life and the legacy of the Princess of Wales when we come back in a moment. I want a pair of jeans that fit. It's their fault. Do we blame the editors who wave these high price tags around uh, do we blame ourselves for buying the magazines? Meanwhile, the public's appetite for celebrity news and pictures shows little sign of being satisfied. And the question has been raised in this case, to what extent are celebrities prepared to go to avoid having their pictures taken? In San Francisco, Willie Monroe, Channel 7 News. Willie mentioned accident scene photos that were taken, and they are apparently already out on the open market. These photos being sold now for a few hundred thousand dollars, mm. but so far, no takers. No takers. It has been a little more than 24 hours now since that tragic accident that claimed the life of Princess Diana. And here on Channel 7 and on ABC, we continue to cover this story. ABC News will broadcast a special two-hour report on the death of Princess Diana that starts tonight at 7 o'clock. And, of course, we'll be back tonight at 11 with the very latest, and we hope you'll join us then. And up next here in this news. You mentioned earlier, angry toward the uh, anchor toward the media. In fact, just uh, in front of me, uh, we've had uh, at least one window broken in a television van this evening. And so um, there have been isolated incidents of uh, at least aggravation. Uh, behind me, at any given moment, there are a couple of thousand people up there paying their respects. It began as a trickle at dawn this morning. Now, many, many hours later, it's turned into a nonstop pilgrimage. Throughout the day in London, Diana's public came to mourn, one by one, flower by flower, at this palace where she lived. At the main gate, where the princess had so often been seen driving her sports car to and from a local gym, an unending stream of people who wanted to leave something of themselves, a secret thought, a personal possession, a tear, a prayer. Most seemed caught up in their own private grief for a woman they had never met, yet missed intensely the moment she was killed. Devastating. She didn't deserve to die. Children brought their precious gifts. Others wrote private messages on cards. As the day wore on, the flowers grew into a monument, the crowds pausing longer as if Diana herself were here. British Prime Minister Tony Blair choking back his emotions. We are today a nation in Britain in a state of shock. 
in mourning, in grief that is so deeply painful for us. Flags flew at half-mast. At Buckingham Palace, the Prince of Wales' own regiment trooped the color, as usual, but today played a composition by Elgar, music usually reserved for fallen heroes. Mike Lee, ABC News, London. Princess Diana and her companion Dodi El Fayed had been seen in for being accused of literally chasing her to her death. Why? Money. A few weeks ago, tabloids reportedly paid $400,000 for these shots of the princess and Dodi Fayed. Now Diana's brother calls it blood money. It would appear that every proprietor and editor of every publication that has paid for intrusive and exploitative photographs of her encouraging greedy and ruthless individuals to risk everything in pursuit of Diana's image has blood on his hands today. Tonight, some paparazzi may be looking for their biggest payday yet. The editor of a U.S. tabloid says worldwide rights to the pictures taken of Diana, trapped in the wreckage, were offered to him for a million dollars. We refused to buy those pictures, and we issued a challenge to the world press to follow our lead and for no one to publish these pictures. There will be more pictures, final images of the funeral of Princess Diana. But her brother says she is in a place now where no photographer or anyone else can touch her anymore. Randall Pinkston, CBS News, New York. For more on the long-standing trouble between photographers and the princess, CBS News correspondent Mark Phillips joins us from London. Mark, had the press pursuit, the pursuit of this paparazzi group of Diana, had it escalated in recent weeks? Well, if Diana thought that uh, in divorcing Prince Charles and in removing herself and in fact being removed from the royal family as a function of the divorce, that that would end the international press uh, interest in her, uh, she was proved very, very wrong. Uh, in fact, of late, that interest had increased, particularly over the summer as the news of the relationship with uh, Dodi Al-Fayed, the man who was also killed, one of the two men who was also killed in the car uh, with her, as that grew the press just uh, swarmed down to the south of France where she vacationed with him uh, twice and it wasn't at all surprising that they were hovering about as they showed up in Paris this past weekend as well. Mark, we've heard an awful lot of talk, uh, let's face it, a lot of it justified about the responsibility of the photographers, some about the responsibility of taking away what had been her official security. Is there talk or is there not in Great Britain about the Prince's own responsibility in this matter? Well, there is. There is. I mean, she, she, you recall the famous TV interview she did uh, about a year and a half ago here uh, on the BBC in which she was asked that very question, would more security uh, be a help to her if she had police around all the time? And she said, no, it wouldn't. That, uh, the press, she may have had uh, a kind of love-hate relationship uh, with the press over the years, using the press a little bit in her own way to get her own view across in her very public battle, of course, uh, with the royals and her very public uh, divorce. But if she had a love-hate relationship with them, they had a love-love relationship with her, Dan. Mark Phillips in London, thanks. The final decision on what type of funeral Britain gives the princess is up to the Queen. The highest honor would be a state funeral that's usually extended only to a king or a queen, but Queen Elizabeth could grant one to Diana. The last non-royal to receive a state funeral was former Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Still to come, more from London and from this side of the Atlantic on the death of a princess. What did you eat this weekend? Chose her to be princess. She's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. So. Whatever love was, it appeared to last through the birth of two sons, William, who may one day be king, and little brother Harry, whom the British people embraced as if they were their own. The royal family had rarely been as popular. But it was popularity, Diana's, that exposed the first visible cracks in the fairy tale. Charles was rumored to feel Diana was getting all the attention when it was he who would inherit the throne. On a trip to Wales, his displeasure was thinly veiled. I've come to the conclusion that really it would have been far easier to have had two wives to have covered both sides of the street. As the years wore on, the marriage became more threadbare. Charles and Diana made little attempt in public to hide the growing coldness between them.
Diana, it would later be revealed, was suffering from bulimia, an eating disorder, and made several suicide attempts that friends described as cries for help. I think the biggest disease this world suffers from in this day and age is a disease of people feeling unloved. It became clear that from the beginning, the fairy tale was a sham. For all of the pomp and circumstance, Diana married a man whom it seemed loved not her, but this woman, Camilla Parker Bowles. The Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. In December of 1992, no the royal separation was announced in the British Parliament. Diana struck out on her own, working with AIDS patients, drug addicts, and alcoholics. But the pressure of a very public and bitter divorce that went all the way to he said, she said books took its toll on Diana. She asked the public for some time off. I will be reducing the extent of the public life I've led so far. But she could not escape the pressures of an interest in her personal life. Pressures that conspired on a Paris street to take away the princess and any chance of a happy ending. In an interview today, Cecciaroli criticized his profession, saying that the limits of good taste have disappeared. We asked ABC's Richard Gisbert to produce this report on the paparazzi. Britain's sadness is tinged with anger, even a little guilt. The angry ones are blaming the media for their constant pursuit of the princess. They should mind their own business. I tell you, it's the last time I ever buy a newspaper. Absolutely. There is nothing in the United States to compare with Britain's sensationalist tabloid press. Five papers with a total circulation of 10.5 million. All the British papers considered anything about Diana news, but the tabloids, with their insatiable appetite for scandal, hounded her relentlessly. I understood the media might be interested in what I did, but I was not aware of how overwhelming that attention would become. Princess Diana didn't always run from the cameras. Not only did she learn to court the press, but over time, she proved to be a deft manipulator of the media. Whether it was the public causes she adopted, the landmines issue, for instance, or the personal battles, such as her propaganda war with the royal family, the media was Diana's weapon of choice. She wanted attention, but she wanted it on her terms. Sadly, there is the other side to the coin, which is that people tend to abuse those terms. With photographers pursuing Diana right up to her final moments, some Britons now want tough new laws to govern the press. But others believe the public is culpable. So easy to blame the media or the press or whatever, but you know we are th those press were after the blood that we 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 buy the newspapers for. Today there's a whole new load of newspapers being reprinted with the same new stuff on there. What are people doing? They're going out and feeding off it. And as long as people have a taste for sensationalism and a lust for scandal, no celebrity will be immune. Richard Gisbert, ABC News, London. The paparazzi, as you surely know, are a worldwide phenomenon, and clashes between these photographers and the celebrities they cover are common, if rarely this tragic. Generally, they are followed by a call for new laws restricting press coverage in some way, and today was no exception. Here's ABC's Jane Clayson. In Hollywood, they're called stockarazzi, and they'll do anything to get the shot. I've seen my mother thrown to the ground by these animals. Security experts say what the paparazzi do is frustrating, but not illegal. We're talking about behavior that if anyone did it who didn't have a camera in their hand, it would be illegal. It would be peeping Tom offenses, trespassing, harassment, or stalking. I don't want you taking pictures of my child, all right? Legal, but an increasing annoyance to stars who are starting to fight back. Hey, turn it off! You just broke my camera. After last night's crash, an angry Tom Cruise called CNN. You don't know what it's like being chased by them. It's, it is harassment under the guise of we are the press, we are entitled, and when people are having a private moment, they should be allowed to have a private moment. People are having Last year, actor George Clooney started a crusade against the paparazzi, boycotting the tabloid TV show Hard Copy and all other shows produced by Paramount Studios. Backed by a small army of angry celebrities, Clooney eventually got Paramount to promise that it wouldn't solicit, purchase, or air paparazzi video. 
It seems now even the largest tabloid in the country, the National Enquirer, is willing to draw the line. We've been offered pictures of Princess Diana and Dodi Fayed in the car that crashed inside the tunnel. Uh, those pictures are on the world market. We have refused to buy those pictures. But other magazines may. The market value of celebrity photographs has skyrocketed. And it's no surprise in the last 10 years in this country, the number of paparazzi has doubled. Jane Clayson, ABC News, Hollywood. It's a debate which pertains to all of us, and it will continue. We'll be back in just a moment. Dodi El Fayed was the eldest son of self-made Egyptian billionaire Mohammed El Fayed, who owns, among other things, the famous British department store Harrods. The young Al Fayed, who was 41, had been a familiar figure on the international jet set and had been linked with numerous beautiful women. No sooner did his relationship with Diana become public than an American model, Kelly Fisher, sued him for breach of contract, claiming that she had given up her career for him only to be dumped for Diana. Al Fayed was involved in producing movies and had money invested in chariots of fire and the world according to Garp. This relationship with the princess came to light in the proverbial way when these photographs were splashed across the British tabloids only a few weeks ago. And we'll continue with this in just a minute. Color is who has its genuine universal concern. Richard Schlesinger, CBS News, New York. When we come back in a few moments, I'll have some final thoughts on this modern-day tragedy. ...from the start. Her shy youth, her innocence. She let 20th century people believe in 18th century fairy tales. A sweet maiden could marry a prince and ride in a gilded carriage to a palace life. A life soon crowned by the births of two cherished sons, heirs to the throne. Here was a fairy story that, that everybody wanted to work. I desperately wanted to work. I, I desperately loved my husband. And I wanted to share everything together. And I thought that we were a very good team. But fairy tales are often full of misfortune and dark forces. This princess struggled with isolation, suicidal depressions, the eating disorder bulimia. She grew thin and pale. She grew apart from her husband. Problems she addressed in a rare and candid 1995 interview, not authorized by the palace. An interview that won her considerable public sympathy. Because I was the one who was always pitched out front, whether it was my clothes, what I said, what my hair was doing, everything. Especially her romantic life after Charles. A short series of attachments to men who were frightened off by the intense media interest in Diana or who turned a personal profit from it. Diana was publicly embarrassed, hurt, betrayed, and resilient. You know, people think that at the end of the day, a man is the only answer. Actually, a fulfilling job is better for me. <laughs> Diana successfully changed her job over the years, from a kind of royal mannequin to a kind and noble social worker. She used her celebrity to bring new focus to the plight of the world's homeless and poor and sick. She reached out to those maimed by landmines, those wasted by AIDS. Someone's got to go out there and love people and show it. After her divorce from Charles last year, Princess Diana lost the right to be called Her Royal Highness. But for many, the way the princess showed and handled her common flaws and common problems made her, in the end, most regal. Beth Nissen, ABC News, New York. And that is World News Tonight for this Sunday. The interest in Diana is such that tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern, we'll have a two-hour special called Diana, Princess of Wales, The Royal Tragedy. I will be joined by Barbara Walters and Diane Sawyer, who knew her and who covered her. I hope you join us. I'm Peter Jennings. Good evening. Turn to this, and finally, to this. Modern paparazzi stalk celebrities with long lenses, helicopters, boats. Some call the new breed the Stalkerazzi. Right over this way, dear. One even parachuted into Liz Taylor's wedding. I believe that there were 20, some 20, some helicopters flying around during a wedding ceremony low, low enough so that people who were attending that wedding ceremony couldn't hear the ceremony. And that's ludicrous. These are usually freelance young kids 
who have bought a camera, learnt how to use it more or less, and just whack away a picture. London Daily Express reporter Paul Callan has spent years observing what ultimately became Diana's dance of death with the paparazzi. Their tenacity is their game, because they know there are big, big dollars, big bucks in selling a good picture. Getting that one-of-a-kind photo or video can be like hitting the lottery. A picture of Madonna and her new baby sold for $150,000. Video of JFK Jr. fighting with his fiancée went for at least $40,000 and possibly as much as $100,000. And this shot of Di kissing Dodie, the one that started the final frenzy, at least $200,000 and perhaps much, much more. Princess Diana had been a favorite target since her engagement in 1981. At first, the shy young woman had a reluctant love affair with the camera. But soon, it turned into a feeding frenzy. There was something about Diana the public simply adored. Her beauty, of course, but also her vulnerability. As long as the public hungered for Diana, the paparazzi simply couldn't let her go. Jonathan Alder is a media analyst for Newsweek and NBC News. Not only was she the most famous woman in the world, uh, she was the only person in the world who truly sold globally, who could sell magazines just by appearing on the cover. Tabloid papers and tabloid TV paid the big money for the hottest photos, but no one in the media was exempt. Many mainstream news organizations are more than happy to use the paparazzi uh, pictures. So now I think you'll see uh, a series of recriminations, uh, serious questions that people in the news business ask themselves, and perhaps uh, a new set of standards for at least the respectable press. Good morning, sir. Though even now, according to National Enquirer editor Steve Koz, photographs of the death scene are making the rounds. And the world press should not buy these photos. Right now, they're, they're trying to sell them around the world for about a million dollars. This is a tragedy. It's a senseless tragedy. It's time to put an end to this. If the picture was available, does Newsweek buy that photograph? Uh, a picture of the a accident? Sure. Absolutely not. Now, I can't speak for what would happen if the picture went out as a news photograph over the wires. But in terms of uh, allowing somebody to profit uh, from this tragedy, no, we wouldn't buy it. But somebody will. Somebody will. And that's because, at root, this is still just business, nothing personal, according to photographer Aubrey Rubin. If I had uh, the last photograph of Princess Diana alive, I certainly would want to sell it because... To the highest bidder. Well, you, that's how you make money. And the truth of the matter is the press did not kill Diana. That's hyperbole, and it does no good to say that. It was the chauffeur's fault? Of course it is. He drove the car. That car smashed into something. As for those seven photographers who were chasing Diana last night in Paris, they've been placed in formal custody by French police while the investigation continues. But Paul Callan says those very photographers may have changed the course of their own industry. The sad irony of Diana's death is that the paparazzi have killed their own golden goose. And as ever, it was the mighty buck, the big dollar, that tempted them. Now, did the press kill Diana? Our discussion with a celebrity photographer and several journalists. Tonight, a Dateline special, the death of a princess. Good evening, I'm Stone Phillips. And I'm Jane Pauley. She was only 19 years old, but it wasn't hard to see why she'd caught the eye of a prince. Diana was a very pretty girl, but no one could have foreseen the glamorous, even powerful woman she'd become, or that she'd die at the young age of 36. Diana, Princess of Wales, was killed last night, along with her companion, Dodi Al-Fayed, and their driver, after the car they were riding in crashed in a tunnel in Paris. Tonight on a special Dateline, Diana, an intimate look at her life, the shy girl who became a princess, then a mother, then a single mother. We'll also look at the questions raised by her death. When does the relentless pursuit of a photograph become reckless, even irresponsible? What role, if any, did the paparazzi play in last night's fatal car crash in Paris? We begin with the latest on the accident that took her life. These were the scenes that stunned the world, the mangled wreckage being lifted from a Paris motorway. 
The devastating news that the princess, who had survived a painful divorce and at times harsh treatment by the press, had not survived the deadly collision. Diana, Princess of Wales, has died. Her final hours were marked by many of the same pleasures and pressures she had experienced for 17 years. The double-edged sword of a life lived in the public eye. It began with a quiet afternoon arrival in Paris for shopping, escorted by Dodi Al-Fayed. But by 8.30 last night, Paris time, the press had caught up with the couple on the Champs-Élysées. Diana and Al-Fayed retreated for dinner at the Ritz Hotel, owned by Al-Fayed's father. It was just after midnight when the couple and a bodyguard were chauffeured away from the Ritz in a black Mercedes. Leaving the Place Vendôme and traveling west along the right bank of the River Seine, at least a half a dozen members of the ever-present press corps reportedly chasing them on motorcycles at speeds well above the 30 mile per hour limit. The car was just traveling at such speed and uh, it was almost as if um, it was in too high a gear. It really, really was tearing away. I, I don't know, maybe it was doing at least 80, maybe 100 miles an hour. Around 12.30, as the car wound into a tunnel just across the river from the Eiffel Tower, something caused the driver to lose control. The 600 series Mercedes struck a concrete divider between lanes, then ricocheted back into the wall before coming to a stop as a tangled pile of twisted metal. Very loud, very loud, you know? And uh, it, it in the tunnel, I say in French, resonance, it was very, Amplifier, the noise was uh, amplified. amplified. Both the driver and Dodi Al-Fayed were killed by the impact. The bodyguard was in critical condition. An early report suggested that while Diana's injuries were serious, there was no indication her life was in danger. Uh, Princess Diana has at least uh, a broken, I'm sorry, Charles, was that a broken leg? A broken, broken arm, broken and, arm concussion, and concussion. I understand. In reality, ambulance crews had spent an hour at the scene trying to save Diana. But with the princess slipping away, they rushed her to a nearby hospital. Admitted at 2 a.m., her heart had stopped. She had suffered massive internal bleeding. At 4 a.m., the struggle to save her ended. And the recriminations began over who is to blame. Taken into custody were seven of the paparazzi said to be involved in the chase. One reportedly roughed up at the scene by outraged onlookers. It's unclear whether any will be charged. In France, it is a crime not to assist at the scene of an accident. And if police determine that the photographer's actions in any way contributed to the crash, they could face charges similar to manslaughter here. Within hours of the accident, even as the wreckage was being hauled away, the pictures from the accident scene were being marketed to the world press. Those pictures have already been offered. They've been offered to us for a quarter million dollars. We've turned them down. As a windy, overcast day in Britain drew to a close today, the car chase that had taken Diana's life had given way to a slow and solemn procession. Her ex-husband Charles and her two sisters looking on as another black vehicle carried the princess from an Air Force base home to London. Joining us now from Paris is NBC News correspondent Ron Allen. Ron, you've been in the tunnel where the accident took place. How narrow is it? How much margin for error is there driving through it? There's not a lot of margin for error at all. It's two very narrow lanes. There are concrete pillars in the middle and a wall on the other side. It's a 30 mile per hour zone and witnesses say these cars are traveling at at least twice the speed limit. And they say they heard a very horrible sounding loud crash when the impact happened. Any other details on exactly what the paparazzi was doing, how close they were following? The police are investigating whether or not the motorcycles were trying to surround the car to slow it down, working as a team, swarming the car, if you will, so that the, the motorcycles in front would slow it down, the others could take pictures of the occupants. It's a familiar technique. They share the profits from the pictures that they sell, and police are trying to investigate whether or not that's what was happening. How long before we might hear about possible charges against any of the paparazzi involved? We're hearing tonight that the police are going to have a press conference tomorrow morning. Under French law, they have 48 hours to hold a suspect without charge. So we may get some clarification tomorrow morning, but I expect that the process will move along quickly. We're also hearing that the prosecutor here will begin questioning the suspects on the record tomorrow, perhaps the beginnings of what you might think of as a grand jury proceeding in the United States, if this were happening in the United States. And there has been word that uh, a possible uh, civil suit being brought by the, uh, the family of Dodi Al-Fayed. 
What do you hear about that in, in Paris? Indeed, the, uh, the Al-Fayed family has a lawyer here who has been saying very publicly that he intends to sue uh, a civil action because of this accident. They were thinking of suing even before the death because of the harassment that the uh, various tabloids were causing to, the, uh, to Diana and Dodie on their vacations. Helicopters hovering too low, speedboats racing by their yacht, that type of harassment. So there is a criminal and, yes, the civil suit that will also perhaps go forward according to the Al-Fayed's lawyers here today. Okay. Thank you very much, Ron. Coming up, how the world woke up to the news. Oh, the poor boys. It's just so sad. Just can't take it in. When this Dateline special, The Death of a Princess, continues. Others knew there was something to say, but struggled to make sense of it. Lady Di was um, a, a great, what? A great doer of good. But from time to time, the feeling and the message just gushed out. She re represented good in this greedy, immoral world. She set out to try to help those who were impoverished, who didn't have much hope. She gave them hope, she comforted them, and she cared about them. And she might have had the trappings of wealth, but she did not abuse those trappings. She used her position to try to help those who had little to live for. Some were stunned that Diana's death had touched them at all. I don't think I really um, thought that much about the royal family until we lost her and it's really touched me. For others, Diana was part of their everyday life. You looked at the morning newspaper and you saw her, like, her face say, she cheered you up a bit, like, you know? She cheers you up. The brooding anger at the way she died was summed up by one simple line. I think they should have left her alone. The ordinary people of Britain, those who believe they adored her most and understood her best, are still standing vigil at Kensington Palace, her home in London. And as dusk fell tonight, the message one woman had attached to her tiny offering of flowers may have said it for the whole nation. Sweetest English rose, true princess of the people, we will miss you always. Your courage and your loving spirit will never be forgotten, and you will remain queen of our hearts forever. It was a terrible shock to everyone. World leaders, no exception. President Clinton was subdued when he spoke to reporters this morning while vacationing on Martha's Vineyard. He praised Diana's efforts to help the poor and needy and said he'd remember her as a friend. For myself, I will uh, always be glad that I knew uh, the princess and uh, always think of her in very uh, strong and positive terms, as will Hillary. And uh, we can only hope that her work will go forward and that uh, uh, everyone who can will support uh, our two fine sons and and help them to have the life and the future that she would want. President Clinton also said this was not the time to blame the media for its possible role in Diana's death. But German Chancellor Helmut Kohl was not so charitable, calling Diana a victim of an increasingly brutal and competitive media, a sentiment shared by very many of the princess's countrymen, who've been served up a steady diet of scandal and gossip at the royal family's expense ever since the ill-fated royal wedding. But lately, Diana emerged from it all triumphant, among the increasingly unpopular House of Windsor, the ex-daughter-in-law of the Queen was probably its most popular member. Though she would never have been Queen, she was destined to be the mother of a future King. Though, as her countrymen learned this morning, she would never live to see it. Here's Keith Miller. We are today a nation in Britain in a state of shock, in mourning, in grief, that is so deeply painful for us. She was a wonderful and a warm human being. Britain's young Prime Minister, yeah, Tony Blair, speaking for every generation, all in shock over the sudden loss of a young princess. Just hours before, his words would have been unthinkable. But while England slept, there was an awful accident. And as England awoke, the words, official, from the BBC. This is uh, BBC television from London. A short while ago, Buckingham Palace confirmed the death of Diana, Princess of Wales. The, the statement was brief. 
The grief contained in a simple tribute, the Union Jack at half staff. She was a living symbol of Britain, even after the divorce from Prince Charles. And the news of her death was devastating to many of her countrymen. This scene was outside Buckingham Palace. In London, the Sunday papers were late. They had stopped the presses as the stunning news developed. But even as they finally hit the streets, it was hard to believe the bold face headlines. <laughs> Everyone's just in total shock this morning. I think it's awful. It's very sad. I'm sorry. She just suddenly seemed so happy in the last few weeks. No, I was really... <laughs> I really thought she looked happy with her poor boys. It was as if the entire nation had awakened to a nightmare. The princess they knew and loved when they had gone to bed was gone in the morning. While most of the United Kingdom woke up late to news of the tragedy, Diana's children were told almost immediately. Prince Charles woke up his two sons before dawn to tell them about the death of their mother. In a convoy of black limousines, the royal family made its way to Crathry Church in Scotland, where they were on vacation. In one car, Prince Charles sat between his sons, William and Harry. The service was closed to cameras and the public, but in a statement, the Queen said she was deeply shocked and distressed by the terrible news. Prince Charles, who once told a worldwide television audience that he never loved his wife, looked grief-stricken at times this afternoon as he traveled to Paris to pick up Diana's body. Diana's coffin, draped in the royal standard, was brought out. Mourners left flowers in front of Buckingham and Kensington palaces, but some were seething with anger at the press. I'm sorry. I blame the Sun newspaper. They killed him. The media. No, no, the paparazzi. Let's say, let's say. Let's close down the Sun newspaper. But mostly, the United Kingdom was united in quiet sorrow today. The words of the Prime Minister, speaking for a nation, at a loss for words. She was the people's princess, and that's how she will stay, how she will remain, in our hearts and in our memories, forever. Prime Minister Blair was speaking for millions of people, too, when he said his thoughts were especially with Charles and Diana's two sons. Prince Charles returned to Scotland to be with William and Harry immediately after bringing Diana's body back to England. NBC's Keith Miller joins us now from London with more. Keith, an announcement about funeral arrangements could come tomorrow, we understand, but what kind of funeral would you expect? Well, Jane, there are actually three levels of royal funerals in this country. The highest of these is a full royal funeral, and it is reserved for a reigning monarch. Interestingly, it can be done for someone of extreme importance, such as Winston Churchill. He received this type of funeral. It's expected that Diana will receive what's known as a private royal funeral, which is reserved for the spouses and children of the royal family. Most observers believe that that was, in fact, what she will receive following her dis uh, divorce from Prince Charles. Uh, Keith, after so many years of acrimony, had there been any warming in the relationship between the prince and princess? Well, Jane, interestingly, it's been uh, almost a year to the date uh, uh, since their divorce. And in that year, they have communicated more and perhaps more effectively than in the previous five years. I think we saw a little bit of that softening today when Prince Charles flew to Paris to retrieve the body of his former wife and bring Diana back to London. Of course, among the public grief that you have seen is a lot of anger. Where is that anger being focused, Keith? Well, interestingly, I think, Jane, because of the uh, involvement of the paparazzi in this uh, tragic incident, a lot of people are angry at the press. Around Buckingham Palace and Kensington Palace, where I was today, people would yell out, assassins, assassins, at the assembled media 
hanging outside uh, recording uh, the, the mourners uh, reaching through, through the gates and delivering flowers. They were very, very angry, and I think a lot of the anger and perhaps even frustration over this tragic loss of Diana is being directed at the media in general. Very well. Thank you, Keith Miller in London. We'll be back in a moment. Coming up, what role, if any, did the media play in Diana's death? I always believed the press would kill her in the end, but not even I could imagine that they would take such a direct hand in her death as seems to be the case. When this Dateline special, The Death of a Princess, continues. Remember, Mr. Poor sheltered life from now on, especially as the insatiable public demand for images of the royals is one of the factors being blamed for today's sad event. The royals may in the end close ranks, and the teenager who's now slated to one day be king may be the beneficiary of a classic closed royal upbringing. But I have to say, for him now, the rest of his upbringing to be completed without Diana by Charles and the Queen uh, goes back to the kind of upbringing Charles himself had, which has turned out a prince who is not for our times. If William does grow up to be king one day, he will have been formed by experiences no previous king has ever had. And he will head a royal household and a royal institution that will have been shaped by the extraordinary life and death of his mother. Now, in a moment, this special edition of 60 Minutes will continue with more on the death of a princess. You'll have to subscribe to those uh, people that take those pictures. And I think that would be better than perhaps some strong law. When it comes to sensationalism and access, the mainstream media tend to blame the tabloids. And the tabloids point to the public's seemingly insatiable appetite for almost any information about the rich and famous. The death of Princess Diana gives all parties reason to reflect long and hard. Jim Hill, CNN, Los Angeles. In a moment, we'll continue. The paparazzi pursued her endlessly, knowing that almost any picture, no matter how it was obtained, could be sold for substantial sums of money. Now, many are blaming that public fascination and the photographers who fed it with contributing to, if not causing, Diana's death. Tonight, Mike Taibbi has a look inside the world of the paparazzi, where the hunger for photos of the famous can go too far. This is not a time for recriminations, but for sadness. However, I would say that I always believed the press would kill her in the end. Earl Charles Spencer mourns the death of a sister. He cannot hide his bitterness. It would appear that every proprietor and editor of every publication that has paid for intrusive and exploitative photographs of her encouraging greedy and ruthless individuals to risk everything in pursuit of Diana's image has blood on his hands today. In a sense, this tragedy began in Rome in the late 50s, the age of Fellini's La Dolce Vita. A new kind of photojournalist prowls the streets in search of celebrity, the paparazzi. Back then, it seemed a game, almost quaint. But soon this turned to this, and finally to this. Modern paparazzi stalk celebrities with long lenses, helicopters, boats. Some call the new breed the stalkerazzi. One even parachuted into Liz Taylor's wedding. I believe that there were 20, some 20, some helicopters flying around during a wedding ceremony low, low enough so that people who were attending that wedding ceremony couldn't hear the ceremony. And that's ludicrous. These are usually freelance young kids who have bought a camera, learnt how to use it more or less, and just whack away a picture. London Daily Express reporter Paul Callan has spent years observing what ultimately became Diana's dance of death with the paparazzi. Their tenacity is their game, because they know there are big, big dollars, big bucks in selling a good picture. Getting that one-of-a-kind photo or video can be like hitting the lottery. A picture of Madonna and her new baby sold for $150,000 video of JFK Jr. fighting with his fiancée went for at least 40000 and possibly as much as $100,000. And this shot of Di kissing Dodie, the one that started the final frenzy, at least $200,000 and perhaps much, much more. Princess Diana had been a favorite target since her engagement in 1981. At first, the shy young woman had a reluctant love affair with the camera. But soon, it turned into a feeding frenzy. 
There was something about Diana the public simply adored. Her beauty, of course, but also her vulnerability. As long as the public hungered for Diana, the paparazzi simply couldn't let her go. Jonathan Alder is a media analyst for Newsweek and NBC News. Not only was she the most famous woman in the world, uh, she was the only person in the world who truly sold globally, who could sell magazines just by appearing on the cover. Tabloid papers and tabloid TV pay the big money for the hottest photos, but no one in the media was exempt. Many mainstream news organizations are more than happy to use the paparazzi uh, pictures. So now I think you'll see uh, a series of recriminations, uh, serious questions that people in the news business ask themselves, uh, and perhaps uh, a new set of standards for at least the respectable press. Good morning, sir. Though even now, according to National Enquirer editor Steve Cause, photographs of the death scene are making the rounds. And the world press should not buy these photos. Right now, they're, they're trying to sell them around the world for about a million dollars. This is a tragedy. It's a senseless tragedy. It's time to put an end to this. If the picture was available, does Newsweek buy that photograph? Uh, a picture of the accident? Sure. Absolutely not. Now, I can't speak for what would happen if the picture went out as a news photograph over the wires. But in terms of uh, allowing somebody to profit uh, from this tragedy, no, we wouldn't buy it. But somebody will. Somebody will. And that's because, at root, this is still just business, nothing personal, according to photographer Aubrey Rubin. If I had uh, the last photograph of Princess Diana alive, I certainly would want to sell it because... To the highest bidder. Well, you, that's how you make money. And the truth of the matter is the press did not kill Diana. That's hyperbole, and it does no good to say that. It was the chauffeur's fault? Of course it is. He drove the car. That car smashed into something. As for those seven photographers who were chasing Diana last night in Paris, they've been placed in formal custody by French police while the investigation continues. But Paul Callan says those very photographers may have changed the course of their own industry. The sad irony of Diana's death is that the paparazzi have killed their own golden goose. And as ever, it was the mighty buck, the big dollar, that tempted them. Today, the Italian photographer who was the inspiration for the movie La Dolce Vita said Diana's death showed there are no longer limits of good taste in his profession. But he also said that celebrities shouldn't try to run away. They should allow themselves to be photographed and then move on. Coming up, who was the new man in Princess Diana's life when the death of a princess, a Dateline special, continues? On the way to glory, even the best stumble. She's starving herself. What you're doing is dangerous. She had to change her life. I know. Talk to people as if, as if, as if she was an ordinary person, not, not some member of the royal family. The royal couple continued to tour the world. But soon, they could no longer hide the coldness between them. Charles would later admit the marriage was breaking down. I mean, any breakdown of, of a marriage is, is, a, is obviously a, you know, a, a dreadful thing. And unfortunately, it causes great unhappiness and consternation and everything else, inevitably. Um, so I suppose, in, at the same time, it's inevitable that... Uh, um, in, in, in the wake of something like that, you, you get all sorts of turbulence. I mean, I, I knew perfectly well. I mean, one of, the, one of the, um, the difficulties I find about this life is, is the predictability of what so many people are going to say about anything at any time. And, uh, but, I, I mean, it's difficult for me to, to know. Obviously, I'd much rather it didn't. It hadn't happened. And uh, I'm sure... Um, my wife would have felt the same. Charles had resumed a relationship with married former girlfriend Camilla Parker Bowles, while Diana's own affairs were also becoming public knowledge. By 1992, when the release of Andrew Morton's book, Diana, Her True Story, betrayed the last secrets of the crumbling royal marriage, Buckingham Palace decided it was no use pretending anymore. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, 
the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. Please, yes. okay. With the paparazzi prying ever more into her private life, Diana reluctantly decided to cut back her public schedule. I hope you can find it in your hearts to understand and to give me the time and space that has been lacking in recent years. But her self-imposed exile did not last for long. Wherever she went, Diana knew the cameras could not keep quiet. And she used the glare of the flashbulbs to shine light on causes that had become dear to her. In 1993, she visited a West London shelter for battered women. I was saying that one minute he'd be hitting you, the next minute he'd be crying. Yes. And then you'd have to be the mother, yeah. yes. having been the abused wife before. Yeah. Buckingham Palace had slowly been reducing Diana's royal duties. So the princess began to imagine a new role for herself. I've been in a privileged position for 15 years, and I've got tremendous knowledge about people and how to communicate. I've learned that, I've got it, and I want to use it. And when I look at people in public life, I'm not a political animal, but I think the biggest disease this world suffers from in this day and age is a disease of people feeling unloved. And I know that I can give love for a minute, for half an hour, for a day, for a month, but I can give, and I'm very happy to do that, and I want to do that. Do you think that the British people are happy with you in your role? I think the British people need someone in public life to give affection, to make them feel important, to support them, to give them light in their dark tunnels. I see it as a possibly unique role. And yes, I've had difficulties, um, as everybody has witnessed over the years. But let's now use the knowledge I've gathered to help other people in distress. Do you think you can? I know I can. I know I can. Yeah. The best way to clear the mine is to dig a trench and simply scrape it away. The charities she supported knew she could. Lord Geoffrey Archer worked with Diana on many charitable campaigns. The vision for this country and for the British people is always going to be a staggeringly beautiful, beautiful and classy lady who was so much more than that because she was William willing to expose and expose causes she believed in and get behind charities she believed in and she made a difference and there aren't many people who do that this princess lived in a palace but was never afraid of the people she reached out to them and everywhere they responded to her <laughs> royal watchers like ingrid seward of majesty magazine knew from the beginning diana was different <laughs> Did she become something beyond royalty? She was Hollywood and royalty. She was Vogue magazine meets Mother Teresa. She was just something that we've never experienced before. She was almost, she was almost sort of holy in a way. We know now the fairy tale ended long ago. The royal family did not allow Princess Diana to become a queen. So she became an icon. night after a private service. His father spent years trying to become a British citizen unsuccessfully, but he said he still feels very patriotic about the country and wanted to bury his son there. Coming up, remembering Diana. But I can give, and I'm very happy to do that, and I want to do that. When the Death of a Princess, a Dateline special, continues. Our own memories of Princess Diana. For me, the word confident comes to mind and clear about the new direction she was taking as a newly independent woman. I spoke with Diana just a few weeks ago when she came to New York to auction dresses for charity. But whether you saw her in person or in pictures as one of the most photographed women in the world, you felt you knew her. Here's Dennis Murphy with a portrait of a royal who touched us all. She was just a girl when we first met her. Shy Di, looking up from her bangs. The nursery school teacher pursued by photographers. From the earliest days, we couldn't get enough of the cultish leggy beauty. And what a romance it promised to be. Lady Diana Spencer, an aristocrat from an ancient English family whose blood was as blue as her intended husband's. 
she went to finishing schools and as a girl loved animals. A career wasn't expected or done. She caught Charles's eye at a country house hunting party. He was 13 years older. But even then, in his 30s, the heir to the throne seemed a tweedy throwback to another generation, an Edwardian, already showing signs of being an entrenched fussy bachelor, what the British call a young fogey. The royal family was putting pressure on him to get on with things and find a bride before all the eligible women were gone. He wore kilts at the family castle in Balmoral, Scotland fished and hunted the royal pastimes, did watercolors and gardened. She listened to Dire Straits on her Walkman, a Londoner who loved clothes and style. The radiant beauty was a shot in the arm that the firm, the stodgy Windsors, the royals, desperately needed to carry on into the next century. And the wedding of the century launched the newest member of the firm. America set its wake-up alarms early to watch through sleepy eyes a pageantry and romance we might never see again. St. Paul's, the dress and the train. Was there ever a little girl's dream that could match the splendor and hopefulness of that morning? A princess born before our eyes. I, Diana Francis. Hi, Diana Francis. Take thee, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee, Philip Charles Arthur George. The couple Tomorrow carried all our hopes for something transcendent in life. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. A happiness we wish they could live in public while we all in our humdrum lives could peek in at from time to time. And some among us became Diana watchers, obsessed, endlessly fascinated by the changing hairstyles, the gowns, the elegance of a woman growing into a classic, stunning beauty. No longer shy die. Diana at glittering balls, movie premieres. Diana on the covers, more of the princess and less and less of the prince. Diana's star so clearly outshined the star of her husband. Did that become a problem in the royal arrangement? Oh, very definitely. I think that it was a very, very big problem for Charles when everywhere they went together, the crowds would cheer her and, and, and rush to meet her and, and want to get close to her and touch her and give her flowers. She had become a star, the living symbol of Britain, as the Beatles had been when she was a child. She was Diana Limited, an industry that sold goodwill for Britain all over the world. Maybe the sun had set on the empire. Maybe English beer was warm and its car shoddy. But here was an English rose who ruled Britannia and ruled a great many of us as well. But her royal job wasn't to be a cover girl. It was to give birth to the heir of the throne. And in less than a year after the wedding, she did, bringing forth the once and future king, William. And two years later came young Prince Harry. The Brits called the boys the heir and the spare. And if the English loved her as a clothes horse and supermodel before the word existed, they loved her even more as a mom. Now they had a royal who actually hugged her children and was delighted to be a mother. Diana, who had come from a broken home, was, was dedicated and devoted to those kids and did not want them to have to suffer. But backstairs at the castles, in the pantries, and in mannered estates around the green and pleasant land, there were rumblings that the fairy tale was coming unraveled. She was restless, learning royal behavior, sometimes depressed and unwell. An outsider criticized by the royal family and its courtiers. She couldn't stand his blood sports, the hunts. He couldn't abide her music and youthful weepiness. The whispers would later become a shout that there wasn't enough love between them to warm up a cup of tea. Do you think he never loved her? I would say that he was probably charmed by her, but I don't know. I really couldn't tell you. I think that he probably cared for her deeply when he, met, when he married her, hoping that maybe things would get better. But soldiering on is something the British have mastered. With his upper lip firmly in place, and with her dazzling smile and yet another fabulous frock, the prince and the princess did their royal duties, making the rounds of the former empire, answering photo calls on vacation, cutting ribbons, raising the two boys, and always, always being pursued by photographers. On the outside, she was always beautiful Diana in her glittering gowns, representing her country so well. What the camera couldn't see was how hollow so much of it had become for the princess. Diana wanted something more than to be an icon of glamour. 
she began visiting hospitals and hospices. The shopaholic princess was growing up, looking for something to do with her life. The photo of the princess alone, Charlesless, at one of the world's most romantic sites, the Taj Mahal, spoke legions. Then came a watershed event in their history as a couple, the publication of this book, Diana, Her True Story by Andrew Morton. The world was stunned to read about her battles with bulimia, about her suicide attempt, and her assertion that Charles had another woman. Diana was getting even, and the abyss between them was going public, and it was getting very nasty. The royal marriage had become a royal soap opera. The aggressive English tabloid press saw blood on the waters and fed on it. Charles' rumored affair with a longtime friend, the married Camilla Parker Bowles, started finding its way into print. The transcript of an alleged phone conversation with his mistress plunged the stock of the royals and of the heir to the throne to a new low. Diana watching became a kind of stalking. Did she have boyfriends? One, a British officer but not quite a gentleman, said he'd had an affair with the princess and sold his story to a tabloid. The Christmas fire at Windsor Castle seemed to be a metaphor for the catastrophe that had descended on the royal family. In I December 1992, the, house, the then Prime Minister surprised few insiders when he announced the prince and princess had split up. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, the prince and princess of Wales have decided to separate. Their royal highnesses have no plans to divorce and their constitutional positions are unaffected. What truly did shock the public was Diana's decision to tell a BBC interviewer details of the failed marriage. Yes, that it was crowded. There were three people in it, referring to her husband's other woman. She told the audience she'd never be their queen, but would like to be their queen of hearts. Charles also used a sympathetic TV documentary to put his side of the story out there. He admitted to an adulterous affair after he said the marriage had broken down. Did you try to be faithful and honorable to your wife when you took on the vow of marriage? Yes, absolutely. And you were? Yes. Until it became irretrievably broken down. Us both having tried. That period in the early 90s was a lurid, messy epic that both Charles and Diana would be slow in recovering from. It truly was... Um a soap opera, a tragedy, Greek tragedy of epic proportions. In December 1995, the Queen sent Charles a letter urging him to divorce. He agreed. In August of last year, the divorce was finalized. She would retain her title, Princess of Wales, and share custody of the two boys. But as she predicted in the BBC interview, she would not be the Queen. But for the British people, she still had a very significant role beyond whatever goodwill tour she would put together. She would always be the mother of the future king, a cherished icon in British culture. But that role was years in the future. What could she do with her present? She still had the thousand-watt celebrity and was free of the palace retainers. Some people chose to interpret my visit as a political statement, but it was not. I am not a political figure. And as I said at the time, and I'd like to reiterate now, my interests are humanitarian. She'd always been a kind of odd hybrid between supermodel and Mother Teresa. Now she concentrated on the latter role. More visiting of the world's sick and undercared for. Thank you very much. She used the photo corps very that very followed her everywhere to focus on new land. passions, like the horror of landmines in places like Bosnia. She auctioned off some of the gowns for charity. She was downsizing the glamour girl image, still looking for her place, and some thought, still looking for the happiness that seemed to have eluded her. Her children gave her great happiness. I think you could look at her and say everything but love. I mean, here is a woman who is beautiful, good family, came from a good family, a broken one, but a, but a good one, and she could have anything she wanted in the world, and she never found a man who truly loved her. With the death of Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, Diana, Princess of Wales, was arguably the best-known woman in the world. Why did we fall in love with this woman? And I think we did, and it was more of an image or an icon that we, that we fell for. Right, well, I think that she has all the things we do love in a famous person. She had beauty, she had class, she had position and, and power in a sense. 
In addition, she happened to be apparently a really good person. So she, she really fulfilled sort of all our fantasies of what a great Royal, what great royalty might be, a great princess might be. The last session of studio photos published in Vanity Fair showed us still another new face, a mature beauty, looking comfortable with her life as she hadn't in a long while. And part of staking out her new life included a, for the first time, public romance with Dodi Alfayette, a foreigner, a playboy, not the right sort to many an insular Brit. It was Diana saying, I'm having a life now, deal with it. She gave a snippy interview she would have left written long ago, she said, had it not been for her royal obligations in raising the heir to the throne. But there was never to be that independent Diana off on the new, happier chapter of her life. There was only the tunnel ahead. Ironically, it was a love-hate relationship with the paparazzi. They had shaped her image as much as the tasteful portraits had. They needed her image to feed the world's appetite for all things Diana. The public can't now blame everything on the press either because the public creates a market for this material. These pictures wouldn't be commanding hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars if that market didn't exist. A princess on her own needed them in a way to keep the mystique alive. So now we have only the images. When we think of her, we'll probably think of that gallery of still photos from Shy Dai and The Bride to the increasingly confident, always beautiful woman of the last years. Bookend images of a life ended too soon. One wedding and a funeral, and in between, a memory for the decades. Today's supporters of one of the causes closest to Diana's heart said they hoped her death would not deal a blow to their fight for a worldwide ban on landmines. Diana was the cause's best known supporter and organizers say they still hope some 100 countries will sign a treaty banning mines later this year as a tribute to her legacy. Coming up, why Diana touched the world. I've got tremendous knowledge about people and how to communicate. I've learned that. I've got it, and I want to use it. When the Death of a Princess, a Dateline special, continues. You're not going to believe this. You grew this from the cells of a single embryo. When they have distorted or allowed others to distort, and the checks roll in as people buy their newspapers, and they go on to greater and greater things, and very few of them are entirely exempt from that charge. Well, there are people who said that she was not only used by the media, but she used them herself. I mean, wh was she in fact her own victim? She did, as it were, live by the media to a very great extent. Now, it is too um, cheap a thought to say that, as it were, uh, she was destroyed by the media. She clearly wasn't destroyed by the media. She was killed in a terrible car accident. Um, but the relationship that she had with the media was at one level caught in a... New York, here again is Jane Pauley. Well, the death of Diana proved to be one of those events that become a defining moment in time in the way those who heard about President Kennedy's assassination will never forget where they were in 1963. Today, we asked John Hockenberry to go to Paris where last night's accident occurred. Here are his thoughts the day after. She dreamed of a world free of explosive landmines, yet she lived her life quite literally in a minefield of aggressive peering camera lenses, the scrutiny of a press that followed every event of her life, where a casual embrace could easily splash across headlines around the world. Princess Diana, of course, embodied the very idea of fame in our era. She was royalty. She was glamour. She was disarming with her smile, her step, her particular turn of phrase. But not since John F. Kennedy has a single person so captured the hearts of people in America and around the world. Like JFK, Diana transcended mere celebrity. She was that rare character who lived in Camelot, but like JFK, had a smile that was an open invitation for all of us to live the dream along with her. She began her public life as a shy, uncertain girl, was a celestial bride, and as we all watched, she grew up before our eyes. 
Like JFK and Jackie, what dye wore became what everyone wanted to wear, how everyone wanted to look. We watched her pain as a struggling, very public wife, a woman seeking to find her way in the unfamiliar and not very friendly world of Buckingham Palace. And this is the loss we all feel, why this strikes such a chord. As much as Diana was a lurid target of the paparazzi, she was also a deeper symbol. For all people whose marriages are troubled, who've ever struggled with divorce, parenthood, in-laws, and still tried to carve out an independent identity for themselves, Diana struggled with all those, her good humor glowing for us to see. A woman at the pinnacle of royalty, not afraid to show us her vulnerability sometimes. In fact, like all public figures measure themselves against JFK, it may well be that Diana is now the high bar for the generation that will most keenly mourn her passing. She was something precious and rare, and not likely to be seen again in our lifetime. Lost in a fast car, down a dark tunnel, and like JFK's last moments, the cameras were watching. We'll be back in a moment. It knows well the perils of celebrity. Actress Elizabeth Taylor. What was your first reaction when you heard about Princess Diana's death? Oh, God. Total disbelief, horror, pain. I think the whole world is in a state of shock. And grief and i know what it's like to be chased in a car by the paparazzi and it's one of the most frightening claustrophobic making feelings in the world because you have no place to go you're in a car you're going faster and faster to try and get away from them they can shoot through darkened windows and you end up in a corner of the car and she must have known such fear. It makes me so angry. What would you say to the editors of these, these tabloids that are thinking about running these? They're books? responsible. The paparazzi were feeding them. Without those magazines, they wouldn't be the paparazzi. And it's getting worse and worse. It finally caused the death of the world's princess. She helped people. She made a difference. Why couldn't they let her be? Maybe she finally found happiness. Is there anything you'd like to say to their families or her family? Yes. I, I know how awful it's going to be for her children. She was such a wonderful mother. And she would have been a great I'm sorry, I can't, I can't talk. I just feel so sorry for the whole family, but especially the little boys. And I wish them luck and love. We invite you to continue watching this CBS station for what we hope will be America's best coverage of the death of Princess Diana. Tomorrow on CBS This Morning, Jane Robolo and Mark McEwen will be on the scene in London with hope tonight as our coverage continues of Diana, the death of a princess. What will Diana's death mean to her children, including the young boy who will one day be king? Will this tragedy change the way the paparazzi do business and Diana's lasting legacy to her country and to the world? A Dateline special, Monday at 8, 7 Central. Now let's take a look at one of the stories we're working on for Dateline Tuesday.
to drive the couple to their destination. And of course, we know what happened. Richard, a couple other questions here. What about Princess Diana's bodyguard? What do we know about his condition? Has he been able to give authorities there any information? Uh, they've said he's not. Uh, he's, uh, he's British, but he, in fact, worked for the Fayed family. Uh, Princess Diana frequently did not travel uh, with a bodyguard, and this was a, uh, a bodyguard that uh, had worked for the, uh, for the uh, Fayeds. Uh, his condition is listed by the hospital as, as serious. Uh, he has injuries to, uh, he has facial injuries, head injuries, and chest injuries, and police say they want to talk to him as soon as he is able. They haven't been able to talk to him yet. And back to the photographers for just a second, and maybe you can uh, try to help explain this to us. We were told that the film from the cameras that the photographers had was confiscated by French authorities, uh, assuming they may have seen these pictures already. But we're also hearing reports that some of these pictures may already have been published um, in German newspapers. How could that happen? I haven't heard reports of the publication of any crash scene photos, but what we had been hearing over the past several days was that film other than these 20 rolls of film uh, police confiscated from the photographers, other pictures may have been taken. And I believe there was uh, an editor of one tabloid newspaper who claimed to have been offered photos uh, of the uh, crash site soon after the crash occurred. Uh, we haven't seen any here, nor do we expect to. So the idea would be that they weren't taken by these men who were arrested? That's, that's the presumption. Of, uh, or they may have been taken by other professional photographers or perhaps by uh, non-professional photographers, others who, who came upon the scene. There were, there were you know, a considerable number of people uh, who did come by uh, before uh, aid arrived and, and while aid was being administered. All right, NBC's Richard Roth reporting live from Paris with the latest information. Richard, thanks very much. And coming up, we'll go... Level, some say, uh, three times the, uh, the legal level. Uh, if the driver was drunk, Greta, does that take any legal responsibility away from the paparazzi? Well, first of all, there's a question whether the driver was drunk. What we are hearing is that he was legally drunk in the country of France, but what I've also read on the wires is that they've determined that he had the functional equivalent of two beers, which may not be as drunk as one might expect. I don't know. I don't know how big a man he was, but he clearly was legally drunk. Now, the fact, let's assume for the fact, for the moment that he was drunk, the question is whether or not the paparazzi can get off the hook. The answer is no. If they in some way contributed to a crime, and the crime being reckless and dangerous, in the country of France. If they were chasing the car, perhaps inciting the driver to drive fast, a judge may determine that they were aiding and abetting in this crime and find them responsible and find them guilty. It all turns on the facts. Were the paparazzi really in hot pursuit or were they back 15 minutes behind and did it just take a little while for them to catch up and they were caught taking pictures, which may be another issue. We simply don't know the facts at the time. The bottom line is though, is if you aid and abet, if you help or cause or contribute to a crime, you are just as guilty even if the other guy is drunk. I uh, want to pass on this compliment, Trencha, who is joining us in uh, on the website. Uh, for you, Greta, Greta is good. <laughs> so. Always sure who they were remembering. That innocent teenager with the 70s hairdo and the doe-eyed look who was to become the fairy tale princess. The proud, plump mother of a future king. The glamorous, glittering cover girl princess the betrayed wife. The woman of the 90s who had to recreate herself as a champion of good causes, Saint Diana to some, a loose cannon to others. And she was doing so well before it was all ended. Such a waste, isn't it? I, I think I'm just speaking for everybody, feel like everybody. It's, it's just incredibly sad. Sad, but fascinating from the start. Diana, at first timidly and then with increasing confidence, reinvented the art of being royal. She did it with style, gracefully, you know. She included everybody. Everybody felt that they were part of the royal family. It's no longer something we know nothing about, something we were frightened of. If anything, it was the royals who felt the fear that Diana had become the leading brand name of the institution the queen called the firm. The pressure from within and without began to tell. She couldn't win because she looked pretty. Everybody wants to see her. And then if she took too much care, she got criticised. You know, and one minute, and she was, everything she did was, was criticised. They couldn't just let her be, let her live her life. 
Perhaps among the public who had bought the pictures the photographers took, there is not just sadness, but also some remorse. It's been said a lot over the past couple of days. It's trite, it's sentimental, it's even soppy. But to judge by the public outpouring, Diana had become the people's princess. And in death, she certainly is the queen of hearts. She's been called an icon for our times, and now she is frozen in time. Forever lovely, forever young, forever lost. Mark Phillips, CBS News, London. And that's part of our world tonight. We'll continue to cover this story. Dan Rather reporting from London. Good night. Inside St. James's Palace, Princess Diana's coffin lay in the peace and privacy of the Chapel Royal. As all day outside, the crowds of people waiting to pay their last respects built up. By tonight, the queue wound its way back to Trafalgar Square. Some came to leave flowers, others to sign the book of condolence. Some left long messages explaining why she'd been so important to them personally, others just a few valedictory words. All of them brought to St. James's by a desire to show how much it affected their lives. We just didn't feel that we could carry on enjoying a holiday without first setting aside a moment to say how very sad we are. I still can't believe it, still can't believe it. That's why I wanted to come up. I wanted to come up and uh, see what was going on and see the fans and everything. And it's beginning to sink in, but it's just not right. It's not right. The question for the palace and the Spencer family was how to respond to this upsurge in public affection within the conventions of court etiquette. In her life, Princess Diana's position within the royal family was ambiguous, but as far as the public is concerned, there was no such ambiguity. She was a real princess who deserved to be buried with full honours. People would want a state funeral. They want people want to show their respect. I don't see why she should be um, denied what the people want to give her. A last respect, if you like. I think it should be a state funeral, royal funeral, so we can all participate. What she will get is not a state funeral as such, but a unique event which the palace hopes avoids the traditional gradations of state funerals and allows a greater degree of public participation, both in the procession through London and the service itself at Westminster Abbey. In the words of Mr Blair, it will be an occasion fit for a people's princess. Indeed, the formula seems to owe as much to the Prime Minister's mastery of the public mood as it does to the palace, combining, according to Downing Street, Princess Diana's modernity with dignity and ceremony. Her coffin will not lie in state to be inspected by the public. That is an honor generally accorded only to monarchs like George VI. But Princess Diana's coffin will be carried on a garden carriage, escorted by members of the regiments with which she had associations. The coffin covered by the royal standard, a sign that in death, the royal family accepts her unambiguously as one of them. Behind, though, will come some of the ordinary people who she met through her charitable work, who will take the place of some of the great and the good who traditionally come to such events as of right. But just as the Duke of Windsor was in death given full royal honours despite the embarrassment he caused to the royal family through abdicating, so Princess Diana will get the full royal treatment. Yes, it is the royal family uh, treating her entirely as if she was still a member of the royal family, which is which is not so unusual because at the time of the divorce, the Queen did say there would be occasions when the princess would be included in, in royal events. Unfortunately, this is not one that she had in mind. 9.45, Big Ben will strike the three quarters and then remain silent for the rest of the day. The nearest occasion in terms of an outpouring of public grief was the funeral of Winston Churchill. But his funeral, preceded by lying in state in recognition of his position as a wartime leader, owed more to the Victorian age in which he was born than it did to the future. Diana Princess Wales is a quite different case. Here was someone whose eyes were not on the past, but on the future. And I think that she would have wanted an element of informality. That may not be easy to bring off in Westminster Abbey, which is, after all, the uh, shrine of kings. But I think they'll have a go, and they'll try and do it. 